I'd like to um, welcome Dr. Sapita Bajistan, um, who is a neuropsychiatrist as well as many other things um, from Stanford University. So, Sapita, welcome. Thank you. Um, to begin with, um, I think it would be very useful uh, for, for our attendees to understand a little bit about the area of expertise um, in, in FND that you work in. Sure, sure. Um, so, um, as you mentioned, Matt, we are a group of um, neuropsychiatrists at Stanford that we have um, a specific interest in um, FND. Um, helping patients with new ways of diagnosing it and treatment and doing research on it and seeing a lot of patients with FND. Um, I myself, I am an assistant professor of psychiatry um, and neuropsychiatry at Stanford University. I'm the section chief of neuropsychiatry up here at Stanford and I, um, I'm the associate director of um, our neuropsychiatry fellowship. Um, and the trainees who come through our program, they get extensive training about FND, diagnosing FND, and treating FND. Um, and it's a big part of our program, and we would like to help train um, psychiatrists, neurologists in this area, um, and help patients as much as we can. Um, so my area of work, um, I have two projects ongoing nowadays, um, and both of them are actually on FND. Uh, one is um, outcome research on group therapy um, for FND and see how much group therapy could be helpful for our um, lovely patients who are suffering from FND. It has been going on uh, for almost three years very successful um, and um, our patients and ourselves we have made a um, very strong bond. Uh, we meet each week and um, it's a support group and also a treatment group. I have another research. Um, I was fortunate to get some grants through our department for this research. Um, it's on um, um, improving the communication between patients and clinicians when the diagnosis of FND needs to be communicated. Um, I have found it, it's a great area of um, difficulty for people to discuss when for the first time a clinician diagnoses a patient with FND, many times they don't know how to convey the diagnosis and it can make some miscommunication, some discomfort in both sides to discuss the FND um, and I've incorporated um, some concepts of neuroscience and mechanism of FND into this communication to make sure that both the clinician and the patient know that this is real um, and there is actual neuroscience background for it and they're not talking about something out there just not real because this is something that gets communicated in diagnosis of FND and it's very unfortunate for both sides. Um, so, so I use my background, I, I used to be a neuroscientist before I became a neuropsychiatrist. My background there, we have reviewed the literature on neuroscience of FND and we are putting it into practice for clinicians and patients to be able to use it. That's, that's fantastic because that seems to be trying to address that the issue that, that we face at the moment, so if you look at the DSM as it currently stands and, yes. and the way that it classifies um, FND um, as, a, as a psychiatric mental um, disorder. Correct. What you're doing there is, is closing that gap, isn't it, in terms of professionals who would maybe look at the DSM in the first place to understand how, how to make a diagnosis, but what you're providing is much more evidence and ways where they can they can look at saying, well, I can make a positive diagnosis because I've now got some science behind that. Correct. Rather than I've tried everything else and nothing's worked, so I'll call it functional. Correct, correct. Yeah, that is something that when we work with our trainees, try very hard to communicate and get them to understand that FND is not an equal to an undiagnosed neurological disorder. So the problem that we face is that sometimes people say, okay, this is not A, not B, not C, not D, so it should be functional, which is not fair to the patients and the clinicians also. It can stay as, okay, this is undiagnosed. Among a lot of other diseases and disorders, FND could be one of them also, but they need to um, rule in the diagnosis of FND rather than saying we ruled out everything, therefore it's FND, because 
neurological disorders are dynamic. Many times we have some initial signs of these neurological disorders and over time we see the full presentation. And at the beginning, it's not easy to diagnose it, whether it's FND or any other neurological disorder, if it's multiple sclerosis, it takes time to get the full picture of it. So it's important for clinicians to be forthcoming with the patients and say, because of A, B, C, and D, I think this is FND. And there are a couple of disorders that are similar to this. And because of A, B, and C, I'm sure that these are not those disorders. But I have ruled in FND, and at the same time, I'm open to discussion if any other signs and symptoms come up. We are open to look into it and make sure that we haven't missed anything. Another problem that comes up is that when a patient gets labeled with FND, people don't look at anything else if something else comes up. Yes. And we have this problem, to be honest, with pretty much all psychiatric disorders. Um, as a psychiatrist, I had to advocate for many of my patients whether they are suffering from FND or depression or PTSD to get other clinicians to look at whether there's something else going on also because they get this label and people are not willing to look at other things. And that's why we, um, we advocate for patients to have a good neurologist that they have a good rapport with and go and see that neurologist on a regular basis, whether it's every six months, whether it's every year, but be in touch and have a neurologist that if anything else comes up, it can be looked into and not being missed. Being said as a part of FND um, itself, we have um, other somatic symptoms also. Somebody with FND, we have seen it in research, like patients with, with FND have more um, higher rates of migraine disease, mm -hmm. or they have higher rates of um, pain sym syndromes. Um, so it's not that like if anything new comes up, it's going to be a new disorder. It could be a part of FND or comorbidities with FND, but at the same time, the door needs to be open to look into if something else is happening. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's, that's quite important, isn't it, to... I think it's, it seems to be difficult getting that awareness and understanding amongst all of the professionals that obviously a patient needs to talk to. As you say, to find somebody that they can rely on, like the neurologists who they can trust and have that rapport. Is exactly. Um, exactly. Are you finding with the people that, are, that you're working with coming through Stanford and, and educating, that there, there is interest much more widely among the new generation um, who are just coming into this field, so the younger people that are coming into and studying this field, that there's more interest, or, or is there equally just as much interest in, in the more mature professionals that are out there that may be just coming into to looking at this? So per my experience, so I think there was a wave of interest years and years ago when it was called more of a conversion disorder and uh, psychiatrists were more into diagnosing and treating these patients. Then the patient kind of got lost in neurological and neurology clinics being untreated. And yeah. now again, there is another wave of interest that neurologists and psychiatrists and neuropsychiatrists trying to work together to help these patients from both sides. Um, so I would say there is more interest nowadays in newer trainees. And of course, when people are um, newer generation of trainees, they get trained with more up-to-date information about it. Um, for example, I've had patients in my own department, they have psychogenic seizures they dropped and are on the floor and like another like attending is like walking by and ask me oh is it epilepsy or is it um pseudo seizure um and i'm like it's not epilepsy but it's psychogenic seizures and it's actual seizure i'm taking care of it so the term pseudo it's a term that's it's it's very unfortunate to be labeled as having a pseudo condition and when I had a presentation at the APA last year, and it was, I, I talked about terms to use and terms not to use. I was saying, for example, if somebody has panic attack, do you call panic attack a pseudo heart attack? Because it looks like a heart attack. Or if somebody has migraine, 
do you call it a pseudo scalp fracture because sometimes it's so painful it feels that your scalp is opening mm. so these are the terms that are still being used and are unhelpful yeah so what i try to communicate to my trainees to my patients to my colleagues is if we want to make it a weird neurological disorder and go and say, no, this is not psychogenic, we don't do a service to our patients. If I want to go to the other side and say, this is something pseudo and not real and fake, we don't do a service to our patients, we need to talk about what it is. For example, PTSD years and years ago was dismissed and was called shell shack. There wasn't any treatment for it. People were called to be weak. They were not as strong soldiers. They were not as strong veterans. And they were um, undermined with their suffering. But now we know PTSD is real. Um, and it's, it, it's very debilitating for patients. I see FND the same. I see psychogenics uh, patients the same. It's as debilitating, if not as epilepsy itself. Um, there's also one research showing that they looked into perception of neurologists and patients with epilepsy and psychogenic non-epileptic um, seizures. Um, and patients in both epileptic patients and psychogenic non-epileptic patients had similar perception of their disturbance of the life, how much of limitations they have in their lives, how much their lives are affected. But the opinion of neurologists was different. So they saw patients with epilepsy sicker than patients with psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Yeah. Which on its own is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's that's really gets to the heart of things, doesn't it, in the way that um, the perception of a functional disorder is right. considered to be different than an organic disorder. Yes. yes. And yet the effect is exactly the, the same. Exactly. And I personally don't like the term organic yep. um, or non-organic because everything is uh, in our brain. We can, some of them, like multiple sclerosis, we can see hard evidence in a structural MRI. But something like functional movement disorder or functional um, seizure or psychogenic seizure, we can see evidence in functional MRI which is available, not available for public, for um, clinical use yet, yep. uh, but we can see the evidence. And if we call one of them non-organic, one of them organic, it doesn't make any sense. All psychiatric disorders have neuroscience evidence behind it. And FND has neuroscience evidence behind it. If we may not see something in a structural MRI, MRI Although in large proportion population of patients with FND, they were able to find some change in, changes in a structural MRI as well. The, um, the thickness of cortex in a specific areas was different, but it's not as significant that the neuro neurologist can look at it and say, okay, this is FND, this is like epilepsy, for example. Yeah. So I personally don't like the term organic and non-organic, and I don't use it with my patients. No, and that, that's, I mean, that's really interesting because it, it's still out there um, almost to try and differentiate. Um, and, and, it, and it does cause, cause issues. I mean, there is somebody, Rebecca here has just asked a question uh, on, on Facebook um, where she knows that FND is not a psychiatric disorder, but, you know, her doctors are still thinking that it is. And, and I guess, you know, that's part of what we're talking about now is that the terminology that's used and also the distinctions that are made on a science basis, maybe mm -hmm. in terms of when people originally studied, they might have studied 20 years ago, um, versus where the, the new research is, is leading us towards. And if you're saying that neuroscience, you know, when you bring all of that to bear um, on this, the evidence is actually there to, to say, you know either through a functional mri but you can see that this is actually what's existing correct so there is one point i want to make sure that i'm clear about it i'm not saying that fnd is not a psychiatric disorder i believe that it is a psychiatric disorder fnd and it's called functional neurological disorder they use this term to make the gap between neurology and psychiatry and not to label patients it's 
For example, PNES is called psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. The problem is that the, um, the label that patients get with psychiatric disorders get transferred into FND when they have neurological symptoms. And then a lot of neurologists who are not used to see patients with psychiatric disorders, they think that this is malingering and they have more stigma around it. Yeah. And it becomes problematic. So my own belief is that FND is it's a multidiscipline. We need a multidisciplinary approach to help. And some of these patients, patients with FND, respond to, for example, physical therapy. Similar to some of our patients, for example, with panic disorder, that they can respond just to breathing retraining. They don't need to go through psychotherapy for years. Some of the patients would need to go through psychotherapy. Both patients with panic disorder, patients with FND, and some patients would need to have medications to treat the comorbid uh, diagnosis. FND, or at least PNES itself, there's one research that shows antidepressants are not particularly helpful more than psychotherapy. It's Dr. LaFrancis' study that compared cognitive behavior therapy to Zoloft only and Zoloft plus co cognitive behavior therapy. The arms with cognitive behavior therapy or cognitive behavior therapy plus Zoloft responded better. So I want to be clear that I believe that if we convey to the patient that FND is just a type of a specific neurological disorder, we also do a disservice to our patients because we are not channeling them to get the right treatment, either if, if it's physical therapy, either if it's psychotherapy, or any other types of therapy. So it's a fine line to walk to yeah. make sure that we are not labeling our patients. At the same time, we are conveying the right diagnosis to them. Yeah. Um, Sorry, go ahead. And being said, um, a lot of my patients have been diagnosed as having neurological disorders for years and years, misdiagnosed. For example, misdiagnosed as having epilepsy while it was psychogenic non-epileptic seizure, being misdiagnosed as having multiple sclerosis while it was functional weakness. And for anybody in our patient's shoes, would be hard to change that mindset from having epilepsy to having psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. People build a community around the diagnosis, people build their identity around it, their family dynamic changes around it, and all of a sudden having to change all the treatment, withdrawing all the um, anti-epileptic medications and getting the actual treatment which would be psychotherapy for most of our patients or support or some physical therapy would be hard for anybody to accept and make that shift quickly. So as a clinician, we need to be mindful of the level of suffering and acceptance of our patients also and, and, um, and walk with them and help them along the way. Yeah. I'm, I, Cause I was going to say, I think, I don't know. My my wife is is the is a sufferer, and and I know she has a fear of 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 the word. You know, it's it's psychological. It's exactly. And I know, and she's not on her own. And I know a, a lot of people. So there's there's still a lot of work that that we need to do. As you said, it's the bringing together of neurologists and and psychologists and psychiatrists, and taking away the fear because I I understand people don't want to be labelled as being mad. Um, because they're, they're clearly not, and they don't want to be thought of as malingering, or that it's all in their head, and therefore, if they just pull themselves together, they, they would sort themselves. It, it's not that, is it? I mean, the point is, is that the brain mm -hmm. is, is a part of the body, it's, exactly. And therefore, in order to, we just need to bring together whatever tools are necessary in order to yep. to try and make it right. Exactly, exactly. And if we talk about the neuroscience behind it. Um, in FND, pretty much similar to many other psychiatric disorders, we have a hypoactivation of limbic system, hyperactivation of limbic system and hypoactivation of frontal lobe. And then we have some hyperconnection 
between lim limbic system and this is the part that is unique to FND. So let me just um, say it from the get-go. So hyperactivation of limbic system, and I'm simplifying it. Um, there are like more details to it. Hyperactivation of limbic system, hypoactivation of frontal lobe. This is what we see in PTSD and panic disorder also. This is the similarity. And we have hyperconnectivity between limbic system and centers for movement in the brain, which is a specific for FND. For example, in patients with FND, for example, positive movement, um, functional positive movement disorders, like somebody who has functional tremor, there is hyperconnectivity between amygdala, which is a part of limbic system, and supplementary motor area, which is a part of the brain that um, controls movements. So this is something that is specific in patients with FND and creates these movements in patients. So this is just a simplified version of um, neuroscience behind it. And I'm saying it to say there are a lot of similarities with other psychiatric disorders and there's something specific about it. And that's the part where physical therapy could be helpful because we're yeah. changing that hyperconnectivity. But I think what you've just dis described there, and, and, it's, and it's probably all of us will need to go back and replay that a few times, but just hearing you talk about it in, in those terms um, is really enlightening. It's not often that you see it being, being described in, in, in such a, a scientific way that just says, well, yes, you can see, you can make the connections. Mm -hmm. and, and I think for people to hear that, you know, somebody like yourself is able to describe this, point to the parts of, of the brain and the body where it's not working right and go, well, yeah, that's what's, what's wrong. We know what's wrong. It's not exactly. a mystery. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. We're, we're getting quite a few questions now through through Facebook uh, on the chat. And yep. I know we've only got you for a limited period of time. And we yep. wanted you to talk about, uh, talk about some of the uh, uh, PNACS um, symptoms. So we'll move into some of those questions now. Um, I am just looking for the first one I can see here. This is from Amy. Uh, mm -hmm. She says, I've been having non-epileptic seizures for nearly four years now, as well as many other symptoms. I was diagnosed with FND and told having an MRI won't show anything. I really want one just for peace of mind, as had minor head trauma prior to the first seizure. She had minor head trauma? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, so she's thinking, should she have an MRI just for peace of mind? She has never had an MRI. Never had an MRI, no. Okay. So it's, it's very hard for me to say without saying me myself. Um, and, and if this is even related to traumatic brain injury or concussion, um, MRI, the MRIs that we have nowadays doesn't show abnormalities. And in our patients with FND and um, PNES in general, they have done studies, history of traumatic brain injury is um, more frequent. So we see that more. So there is some correlation. I'm not talking about causal relationship. There's some correlation with patients who have had TBI concussions and PNES and FND, especially PNES. Any assault to the brain can make the PNES more likely. Um, I, I can't say whether she, um, Amy needs to do an MRI for the peace of mind or not. If it was a minor head trauma chance, and if we are talking about concussion or mild TBI, chances of seeing something abnormal in the brain is very, very minimum. Yeah because we can't see it for our MRI, the sensitivity that we have nowadays. Yeah, yeah. But if the neurologists think that it's, it's fine to get an MRI to make sure that um, a significant abnormality is not going on in the brain, that's fine, but it's hard to say. Um, that, that I would say it myself without seeing any. 
yeah no that's that's fair enough and then it's important i think everybody needs to understand as well um that obviously you know the position to advise about personal situations we've got to keep things as general as, as possible so sure. um now pamela here has got a question um regarding her daughter she says my daughter has spent 10 months in a psychiatric ward uh, she's been diagnosed with conversion disorder dissociative attack disorder and uh, they have put her on uh haloperidol mm -hmm. stop the seizures um she's asking is this the right thing for her because they admitted that they didn't know anything about the condition so this is the i guess let's try and keep this a little bit bit general rather than specific because you can't comment on that but Correct. Use of, of medication uh, in treating seizures, obviously there are epileptic medicines that can be done, but when you don't have epilepsy and you're being treated with epileptic medicines, what's the impact? Correct. Um, so we're talking about halidol here or epileptic medications? Uh, this is uh, haloperidol. Yeah. Haloperidol. So, so if we are sure that the patient just has psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, Anti-epileptic medications won't help. At the same time, we need to be mindful. Sometimes some patients have comorbid diagnosis, which means they have both psychogenic seizures and epileptic seizures. For those patients who are also diagnosed with epileptic seizures, they would need to have anti-epileptic medications. Or when a clinician is seeing the patient, it's very hard to uh, distinguish between the both whether it's epileptic or non-epileptic seizures, many times they keep at least one anti-epileptic medication on board to make sure that they're not just letting an epileptic seizure to go on for a long time. It's hard to diagnose epileptic seizures or non-epileptic seizures for sure, because if it's not happening frequent enough, they can't use the gold standard um, diagnostic um, way, which is having the patient um, hospitalized and getting um, uh, getting them in epilepsy monitoring units and capturing the seizures and see whether it's epileptic or non-epileptic. In those times, they might have one anti-epileptic medication on board. But if the diagnosis is clear that it's not epileptic, it's psychogenic, they're not helpful. In terms of haloperidol, it's an antipsychotic medication. Um, there's no research showing that haloperidol or antipsychotic medications are helpful for PNES. Being said, sometimes patients have comorbid psychiatric disorders, and medications could be helpful for comorbid psychiatric disorders. So um, it's there's a lot of there are a lot of subtleties to these diagnoses. It's not that this is one thing and nothing else. So there are comorbidities to the diagnosis, and there are some disorders that can be in parallel to this um, diagnosis, both from the neurological side and from psychiatric side. Okay, okay, okay. And which, I mean, as you say, the diagnosis is, is complicated because there are, are so many substances in, in that. Correct. In terms of identifying the, the trigger for PNES, Mm -hmm. um, trauma can be part of that, be it a physical trauma. Mm -hmm. But what, when I mean, people are asking some, some general sort of questions, you know, what is the cause of this? Is, is, there any, is there anything that you can sort of point to as being, well, that we know is, is definitely going to be a trigger for it all? So are we talking about the cause in general for developing the disorder, or are we talking about precipitants on, in daily life? I would, yeah. That, let's let's deal with the the where tremors are happening in in daily life. So yeah, let's let's talk about that first of all. Got it. So it's hard to say. It's um, case by case. Um, a lot of triggers could be similar to triggers for epilepsy on its own. For example, um, being sleep deprived can make the frequency um, of psychogenic PNES um, more and can make the frequency of epilepsy more also. Um, being stressed out can increase the frequency of epilepsy more and frequency of PNES more also. 
And I want to make sure to emphasize here that some of the clinicians, when a patient says, that I was stressed out for this time and then these seizures start, they make the miss um, connection here and think that, okay, this should be psychogenic, which is not accurate. A lot of epileptic seizures can be triggered by stressful situations. Um, and, and sometimes changes when people go out and it's really cold, that um, significant sudden change of temperature can make these seizures happen in them. I've had patients when they're exposed to bright light all of a sudden, or a screen uh, like TV for a long time, they can have um, these seizures also. Something to keep in mind uh, for reducing the frequency is patients getting to know themselves and pacing themselves during the day. That not putting too much pressure on themselves on daily life and this is specific for every single patient that they can get to understand themselves over time and the triggers and work with their clinicians or therapists or their family to reduce the triggers or over time learning the skills to tolerate the triggers more okay okay yeah no it's interesting we had uh, one of the attendees in the other uh, webinar uh, this afternoon um, she was from Canada, uh, and she made the point that if she didn't wrap up warm when she went out, <laughs> especially in winter, that would trigger tremors because of the, yeah. the change in temperature. So, um, so there are lots of environmental factors that can exactly. be, yeah. So it's a Some case of my patients, um, pain can be a trigger. Yeah. Um, I have patients with um, serious pain disorders. And if that pain disorder gets started, that can trigger um, a, a PNES episode. So pain on its own, either it's like a severe migraine headache, or if it's like a pretty bad back pain, um, or another type of pain can induce um, these episodes as well. Yeah. Um, and, and We've got Janine's asked a question here. She said, what are the best treatments? Is it only psychotherapy? What about medication? I mean, we kind of touched on the medication before in right. terms of, you know, epileptic medicines and, and so on. But um, I know from what you said earlier, psychotherapy does play a big part um, in this. But also you did say that physiotherapy can play a part mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, so physiotherapy for conditions that physiotherapy could be helpful. For example, um, if somebody has functional weakness, physiotherapy could be very helpful. Yeah. If somebody has um, functional tremor, physiotherapy can be helpful. But if somebody has psych functional seizures, physiotherapy may not be helpful. Um, because like, what do you want to do during the physiotherapy? This happens like an attack and all of a sudden physiotherapists can not do much to help the patient. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just looking here. This is a rather long, long one from Catherine. Um, she says, my daughter had a minor fall when she was 11 and injured her heel bone. She went on to develop complex regional pain syndrome. After 10 months, she was back on her feet and got back to school part time. She became exhausted and developed chronic fatigue. She also has hypermobility. She had glandular fever at some point too. A few months later, she began having seizures. She has had them every day for the past two and a half years, at least 10 a day. It seems her nervous system has just gone over the rails. They are triggered by pain, tiredness, noise, light, stress, and hormones. She does well pacing, but we just can't seem to make any progress with the seizures, and she's now 17. Mm. Uh, so it all sounds, that, I mean, that sounds very, very dramatic, but yeah. what, what can you say to somebody who's facing that, where things just seem to be getting worse rather than better? Yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, I, I feel for Catherine and, and her daughter, and, and they're dealing not with one diagnosis, but with a um, um, with a number of them, and the problem is that it becomes catch twenty two. You want to treat the pain at the same time, 
Um, it takes time. They can trigger the seizures. Seizures themselves can trigger the pain, and it would be pretty hard to um, to close the loop. Um, I would say they would need to work with um, a group of clinicians that they can communicate with each other. Communication is very, very important when we are dealing with a number of diagnoses. For example, if somebody is treating the pain syndrome, somebody is treating the attacks, and somebody else is treating the um, chronic fatigue, they need to be in communication with each other, make sure that um, the treatment for one doesn't affect the other one. For example, patients can be put on opioids for, uh, for pain and they need it. But if the dosage is not the right dose, if it's too much, it can trigger um, dissociative attacks on its own. Um, so the dosage of medications, the treatment need to be communicated among the clinicians to make sure that everybody is um, on the same page. And um, she might benefit from um, group therapy, for example, not feeling that she's the only person dealing with this disorder. Um, and, and at the same time, having an individual therapist and working on the pain also. Um, I feel for them, it's hard when there are a couple of diagnoses um, at the same time. Um, but I've seen patients working on them and getting better. I've, most of my patients have pain disorders also. Yeah. Um, it's not that it's, um, it's not going to get better, but it's complicated. Yeah. Um, okay. We are coming to the end of this webinar. We need to wrap up in about five minutes time. So if you've got any more questions, please, please fire them through now. Um, Berglund has a question. Um, She's asked, periods, when women are having their periods, why would that start a seizure? A uh, periods, what would they start a seizure? Hmm. Yeah. So hormonal changes can start the seizures also. Um, and also, it could be painful, it could be stressful for people to have periods. Um, any pain can induce the seizures also. So these changes in the hormonal um, levels in the body and also um, the pain and the change in the body, all of them can induce seizures. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Janine has just asked, does having pins and needles in your face, is that part of FND or is that evidence of a seizure? Hard to say. Again, um, it's hard to make the diagnosis yeah. um, um, far away. And if I if I do that, I would do a disservice to anybody um, um, to do it. I'm, I'm not able to to say. It can happen in both. Um, as a part of seizure, seizure itself, epileptic seizure itself usually doesn't have pins and needles, but it can come as a prodromal syndrome before starting of the seizures can happen yeah um, or it can happen afterwards also so um this person needs to see a clinician to make the diagnosis it can it can happen in both i mean it's an interesting question uh, and i've and i've seen this being being asked a few times but but what actually constitutes a seizure yeah is it a tremor is it a jerk you know, there's people will say different things. If I just zone out, is that a seizure? What are the things that would define what a seizure actually is? Correct. That's a that's a very good question. Um, so if if you can say like a tremor, if it becomes very volatile and if it becomes huge and the person drops afterwards, or even not dropping, just like having very, very big volatile movements, another person can just call it a seizure. So I would say the way that they, they distinguish is they're using the same um, terminology that they use in neurology and then add the functional on top of that. So if something is being seen as a tremor in neurology or something else is being seen as a seizure in neurology, then it, when they diagnose it as a functional, they put a functional in front of it. 
Um, or for example, we have absence seizure, which is an epileptic seizure, and it's just an attack and drop. So if, if somebody diagnoses a patient as this episode being functional, they might call it a functional seizure, or they might call it a functional attack disorder, for example. So there's complexity in terminology as well, but it's a spectrum. It's yeah. hard to just draw a specific line. Okay, this is tremor, this is seizure. It's hard to say that. Even if it's a neurological tremor, if it's a neurological epileptic disorder, um, it could be hard to say. But what we see in most of neurologic epileptic disorders is that we see the discharge in the brain when they have long-term um, EEGs. Being said, it cannot be seen in everybody. Yeah. So there are lots of complexity in different levels, which makes it hard. Well, I think, again, it's, it's valuable for, for people to understand that there's a spectrum. Um, um, and and that's, that's, that's great insight. Um, I think that's a pretty, a, a, a pretty good place for us to, to wrap things up. I have one last question. Um, I, th I think people will be very interested in, obviously, this. But, but what do you see as being the long-term outcomes for, for treatment? of mm -hmm. the NES. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do we get to, to make you know, resolution better and, and encourage that Correct. You know, we can improve Correct. outcomes? So what I would say, um, so for example, comparing PNES to another neurological disorder, like comparing PNES to epilepsy, or comparing PNES to the closest psychiatric disorder, for example, panic disorder or, or PTSD, um, the number of research on treatment is way, way, way lower in PNS compared to those disorders. That's the problem that we are dealing with, and that's why there are not enough um, established treatments for PNS. Um, being said, there are studies showing that um, psychotherapy is helpful, but most of the studies or um, physical therapy and physiotherapy is helpful, but again, most of the studies are short-term. Um, there are not the studies that they have followed the patients long-term and see what happened, what were the factors that help some patients to recover completely, some patients having fluctuations in symptoms and some patients not getting much better. That is the gap that we have in literature. Um, and and that's the part that makes it hard to answer to patients and tell them what would be the long-term uh, prognosis because we don't have enough literature on it. Being said, in my own clinical experience with my patients, patients who have gone to treatment, who have been invested in getting better, um, have had very good positive outcomes. Um, I've had patients who were isolated in their houses. They had um, seizures happening on a daily basis, not much of relationship with other people because like any other disorder, it can make you debilitated. But after going through treatment, getting accepted diagnosis, they're living happy lives, independent lives, going out in the community, working and uh, not suffering. And if there is any relapse of the symptoms, they know what is the treatment and they work with it. It's not that they're going back to point zero and starting over. It's like any other disorder that we can deal with. If I have, for example, high blood pressure, if I have hypertension, I exercise, I take my medications, I get my blood pressure under control, but in an episode of the time, I can be stressed out, I may put on some weight, I may get the hypertension again. I get back on track, I exercise, take my medication, and hope that it goes away. So, so it's something that it's, again, dependent on every single patient. Um, for some people, they can get back on life, work, um, and get back to the school, um, some people have fluctuation in symptoms, and for some other people, it could be a chronic um, condition. But we don't have enough literature and research on it to say what type of patients would be the patients who can get on their own and 
under life over time. Um, but I've seen patients getting back to their lives um, and living healthy lives. Well, I think that's a great positive note to, to end this session on. Uh, so Peter, I want to thank you very, very much for your time thank you. um, this, this morning. It's been fantastic talking to you. Um, to all our attendees, thank you. Uh, thank you for the great questions. Uh, but thanks again, Peter. It's been, been wonderful. Thank you, Matt, for arranging everything. And thank you for everybody in FND Hope.